you notice there's some verses missing from our gospel reading, and that's because the story that's in there sounds a lot like the story we read last week. Jesus is at the synagogue on the Sabbath, and a, a man comes in this time instead of a woman who's got a condition called dropsy, or what we'd call edema, swelling. And there on the Sabbath, Jesus heals him. Now, last week during the story, we read that um, some of the Pharisees, at least, believed that this sort of healing to be a violation of, Sabbath, of the Sabbath work restriction. In that story, Jesus shamed his opponents. In this one, however, he appears to have none. When he asks them, do you think what I did is lawful? Nobody says a word. Now, surely they had opinions. I mean, powerful people always have opinions, right? But nobody said anything. I wonder why that is. Then, next, on a completely unrelated topic, Jesus also challenges the way those same people jockey among themselves for positions uh, of honor at the table. Now, that was a socially accepted way for folks to increase their social status. And ancient Mediterranean culture, including both Palestinian and Roman culture, was intensely uh, competitive when it came to status. In this culture, status or honor is a zero-sum game. For me to move up a seat at the table, somebody else has to move down. And nothing would cause you to move down, like, say, I don't know, picking a fight with the guest of honor over whether or not it's lawful to heal on the Sabbath, and then losing, like the synagogue leader last week. But equally is shaming would be siding with that guest against the host who invited them. Hmm, maybe that's why nobody said anything, do you think? Let's also not forget that Jesus' audience here, the guests at this dinner, are largely Pharisees and scribes. They are the people who, at least by their own reckoning, enjoyed the highest status with God, because they are the people who know and follow the whole of Jewish law. They are the experts. And according to Luke's gospel, it is that very expertise that so often blinds them to what God is doing right in front of them, as they get so wrapped up in the specifics of the commandments, they neglect the spirit and the reason behind them. In that sense, I wonder if Jesus' challenge to them about the seating at the dinner party may actually be about this larger issue of the scribes and Pharisees choosing places of honor at God's table, so to speak. If they see themselves as more deserving of honor, as more righteous in God's eyes because of their obedience to the law or the religious adherence, then those who lack those things are, by necessity, lower in God's estimation than they are. For them to move up a seat, somebody else has to move down. We don't have the same... Uh, honor code that these folks did, but in some ways morality works a little bit like this. If I want to be a good person, I have to define what is bad and who is bad. Our identities, much like the scribes and the Pharisees, are just as much about who we are not as they are about who we are. The guests at this party identify as righteous, pious people of society. And the way they behave at that dinner is completely in line with that. They spend their entire lives trying to move up the table to get at those seats of honor. So why shouldn't they also deserve seats of honor at this table? As I read this story, I see the Pharisees and the scribes at this dinner trying literally to sit closer to Jesus, the guest of honor. And I wonder if the deeper story is about their attempts in their lives to get seats closer to God. And I can empathize with that. Isn't that what we'd all like? Isn't that what we'd all want? Isn't that where we'd all want to be? And yet the parable suggests that our own attempts to move up so often work against us. The righteousness and the obedience of the Pharisees is actually what keeps them from knowing God more fully, keeps them from recognizing who Jesus is. I wonder if that's what Jesus sees too, and that's why he says what he does at this party. 
We might well read this parable as a rebuke against the almost comedic selfishness and self-importance of the dinner guests. But I have to wonder, what if it's really compassionate advice? What Jesus tells them is basically common knowledge. The proverb we read this morning is something like a thousand years older than Jesus' parable. It's something that all the folks at the dinner would have known. And they could all, they are probably all had the experience or could at least easily imagine what it would be like to be in the place of that parable, right? The embarrassment of being told to move down and the honor of being asked to move up. What the parable does is not teach them something new. It applies what they already know more widely. Trying to get ahead often accomplishes just the opposite. If that's true at a dinner party, why would it not be true about the rest of life? Why would it not be true about God? I hear Jesus' parable challenging his audience to consider that maybe God isn't seated at the head of the table. That maybe God's table doesn't work this way at all. What if instead of saying that lower is better, Jesus' point is actually that the only, win to, the only way to win is to stop playing the game. In the second part of the story, Jesus encourages his host to invite those who can't pay him back with a reciprocating invitation. In other words, he's inviting him to give a luncheon for the purpose not of repaying or accruing favors, but for the simple purpose of showing hospitality to others. What a concept. Or as the preacher of the letter to the Hebrews might say, so that mutual love may continue. It's in the sharing of this mutual love, not in the moving to a higher seat, that we end up sitting next to God because this mutual love is what God does. That's who God is. The Greek word the preacher uses for mutual love is Philadelphia. You might know that one. Uh, that's one of the Greek words we've all heard. It means uh, brotherly or sisterly love, right? It's the love that's shared among members of the same family, who have the same, people who have the same identity. But in the next sentence, he pairs it with another Greek word, translated hospitality to strangers, the Greek word philozenia. It means love shared among people who do not belong to the same family or have the same identity. This love is embodied in Jesus Christ, in whom God extends the invitation of grace to those who cannot repay God in any way, turning strangers and enemies into family members. That mutual love is where we will find God, not at the head or at the foot of the table, but simply sharing in the meal, in the sharing of the meal. That fact, that love, the preacher says, is the same yesterday and today and forever. It is worthy of our trust. And so the question is, what does it look like to trust in that love? The letter has some suggestions. Welcome strangers. Remember those in prison. Honor marriage. Be content with what you have. But to me, the most interesting part is the end of verse 6. What can anyone do to me? The word anyone is actually better translated human or mortal. So basically it says, if, I, if my trust is in God, what can any mortal or anything created by humans do to me? I find that interesting because those things created by humans includes our own identities, our own sense of worth. Everyone has a need to feel loved and accepted. And we all fill that need in different ways. Some of us work hard or try to produce or accomplish things. Some folks want to please everybody around them, make everybody happy. Others try to make themselves look good. Others do their best to be dependable or loyal to earn respect. But no matter what, we all have something in our lives that we believe makes people good. We may or may not feel like we have that thing, but we believe that it exists. And I wonder if that's really what's behind the Pharisees' self-righteousness in this story. 
What if, deep down, this is not a story about an overblown sense of pride, but a fear of never being enough? What if instead of the joy of following God's laws, their hearts are full of the fear of being punished if they don't? Wouldn't that drive people to constantly try to prove how much they deserve what they have? What I hear in our scripture stories today is the challenge to all of us to find and to let go of whatever it is that we believe makes us worthy. To stop competing over one, with one another over what amounts to seats at some table, but to actually trust God's message that our own sense of worth doesn't actually come from us at all. And that's no easy task. When one's entire identity is built around that thing that makes us feel worthy, whatever that might be, letting go of that thing is like dying. In fact, it is dying in a very real way because it is the destruction of one's identity. I think that one of the deepest questions this, task, this text asks, asks us to ponder is what that thing is for each of us. What secretly makes you feel worthwhile? Is it how hard you work? How much people like you? How useful you are? Is it how much people respect you or what they will remember about you, what you hope they will remember about you when you're gone? Now imagine what it would be like to give that up what if you lost all that? How would that feel? What would be left? I also wonder as I read these stories what they mean for us as a congregation. What if we were to let go of those things that give us the most anxiety and simply focus on letting mutual love continue? What if we stopped trying to save this congregation? What if we gave up on a balanced budget? What if we quit trying to attract new members and just let mutual love continue? Maybe we would find new meaning and purpose and grow in a way that we never expected. Or maybe we wouldn't. Maybe Anya's day would die. But maybe something new would rise from the ashes. Would that be a failure? Would that be a bad thing? Those are questions I can't answer, but they're questions that I think it's worth pondering, and I think it's worth pondering them together. I can't help but wonder how much of what we do, with all the best intent and with all the purpose of trying to feel closer to God, ends up being trying to earn a seat of honor at some table or another. And the one thing that I hear very clearly today is that whether we live or die, whether we are esteemed or hated by those around us, whether we succeed or fail at what we're trying to do, in God's eyes, it doesn't really matter. God has already extended to us the greatest gift that God can give, and there is no way to repay it. I suspect that even if there was, God might refuse our efforts to do so. Because that's who God is. God is the one who throws a party and invites the people who can't invite God back. At God's table, every seat is a seat of honor. Because at God's table, it doesn't matter where you're sitting, it matters that mutual love continues.